This episode of The Trap Set is brought to you in part by Colectivo Coffee, handmade coffee since 1993. Check them out online at colectivo.com. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set, where each week we explore the lives of drummers. I want to play something for you. Hearing Here Come the Rome Plows by Drive Like Jehu, featuring my guest, Mark Trombino on drums. Trombino's cerebral and sinewy grooves provided the perfect foundation for the highly influential San Diego-based band. After Drive Like Jehu's brief first run, Mark channeled his perfectionist impulses into a prolific career as a record producer, working with bands such as Blink-182, Jimmy Eat World, and Rilo Kiley. For the past few years, Trombino's laser focus has shifted yet again, this time to Donut Friend, his popular donut shop in Highland Park, Los Angeles. And now my conversation with Mark Trombino. It's weird, it's like we weren't a very art, arty or musical house. Um, you know, my parents had a re- an old reel-to-reel tape machine, and occasionally they would bust out some jazz or something. I think they had some old records too, but for the most part, music wasn't didn't play in our house, and no, none of my family was artistic or musical in any way. Um, did you think of yourself as artistic and musical? I did. I was like definitely even from a super early age, like you know, really artistic and really into drawing and and. Yeah, I, I, I thought of myself like when I was a little kid, like I'm going to be an artist kind of thing because um, I thought I had a knack for for drawing, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I've always kind of thought of myself as artistic, which is weird, but also like. Super Why is that weird? Because of the family I grew up in, just because I'm no one, you know, it didn't come from my parents. Um, I don't know where it came from. What was your process of learning to play drums? Uh, I took lessons, like went to the local music shop or whatever, you know, took took lessons. I, it was like that typical, like, oh, my parents, you know, rented me a snare drum or something, you know, and like learning rudiments or whatever on a snare drum. And then I quickly transitioned to like the guy that was like teaching at that music shop, you know, did private lessons at his house. And so I started doing that. And I think I did that for not, not that long. Um, uh, I discovered that yeah, you know, I didn't really. I wasn't really learning that much, and I, I was learning more just by, you know, putting on records and putting on headphones and drumming along to records at home. Um, I also got into the marching band and stuff like that, so I was learning a lot of stuff there. Um, so that's pretty pretty much it. By the time you were in high school and doing the marching band, what kind of music were you listening to? Um, punk rock or whatever. Like I had older friends like um, who introduced me to like circle jerks and sex pistols and whatever all like old school punk stuff and so that's high school was all punk rock um, when you were in high school what did you think you would be doing as an adult um i wanted to be a pilot when i was like first starting in high school I, actually i like applied to be like to go to like the coast guard academy because i knew i couldn't get into the air force academy so i applied to the coast guard academy and i didn't get into that either um why not i don't know i not not smart enough or something didn't have the right recommendations I, I don't know but didn't make it um but yeah so pilot was something and then um i got really into computers so i wanted to be a computer programmer guy so this is in the 80s yeah mm-hmm. what kind of computer did you have i had an apple 2e did you know basic yeah of course All right apple basic yeah <laughs> that's yeah. the first language i learned on computers too yeah 
Oh my God. I loved it. I was so into it. Then what, what was your next step? Did you get into like C or Pascal or something like that? Yeah. Well, I, so, um, I was into that. I went to, when I went to UCSD, I was like kind of studying, uh, I went for computer science or whatever. And so I, yeah, I learned C and, and Lisp and, you know, assembly and, you know, all these different languages, um, and wrote some like music apps and, you know, just did stupid things. Um, that was fun. I miss, I miss programming. So you have a logical kind of analytical mind by nature. Yeah. And then the other thing that maybe appealed to you at, around that time is that computers were kind of more of a subculture in the same way that punk was a subculture. Probably. I, I didn't think of it, but yeah, probably. I mean, it, that, that's, that was exciting to me when I was first getting into computers. It felt like a little underground. Yeah. I don't know if I felt that for me, it's just like, I've always been kind of a loner. So like, working alone on and on a computer is is just something i like to do it's very meditative zen for me to just get lost in code did you graduate with a computer science degree i didn't i kind of struggled a little bit in the computer science i i wasn't one of those like guys that spent all night in the computer lab you had to actually go to a mm-hmm. computer lab back then yeah uh, and uh and i i was working full time and i was in bands so like school was kind of like my third priority or something. And I just kind of fucked up a little bit. I mean, I didn't, I didn't do badly, but I just wasn't keeping up. And so. Is that something that you regret? Yeah, kind of. Although, I mean, I'm ha- super stoked on how things have turned out. Yeah. But like I do kind of wonder a lot, like what, how different would things be had I kind of really concentrated on school and pursued the, um, the computer stuff. Um, probably probably yeah it'd be very different but um yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you dropped out of school no i didn't drop out i i just i had to take a music class for an elective and so i took this um it was like an experimental music class or whatever and i was introduced to computer music and um so I got to listen to stuff like where computers were generating music or synthesizing music or composing music and i was like fuck this is rad like what like these are my two passions like computers and music I, I can do put them together and do something so I changed my mu- major into music not even thinking it through or, or doing any research or, and realizing that there was no undergraduate computer music program um, but I was able to take like graduate classes and eventually like my co- college allowed me to like kind of write my own major and so I just kind of pulled all my music classes and computer classes together and got a faculty to sponsor it. And I wound up with a degree in computer music, even though one didn't actually exist at the time. It does now though. Have you ever been one to really worry about what's happening next? Mm -hmm. You are. Yeah, always. Yeah. Okay. So you were a little bit nervous when you graduated or what was your, what was your next step? Well, by the time I graduated, uh, I was in Drive Lake Jehu. Okay. And so, you know, I had a, had a band I think that, uh, well, I, I'm not sure if I'd started recording. Yeah, no, I must have, I've been, I was recording at that point. So I think I, I kind of thought maybe that's something that I could be doing is producing albums. Um, because, you know, when I was in the music department, I had access to a recording studio, kind of shitty electronic one, but I could like record bands there. So I kind of learned how to do it. And, um, by the time I graduated, I was kind of, I think I was already getting some work as an engineer. I'm not sure, though. It might have been a little bit after. Do you think that you are pretty instinctual when it comes to engineering and producing? Uh, or do you think a lot? I think a lot. Um, I think that I, yeah, I'm always, I think I'm, I'm, I think a lot. I'm always trying to, like, figure out better ways to do things. And, and you know, like, I just, it, I'm, the kind of guy who will just keep trying things over and over until it like I kind of get it get it right or whatever um which is how I made records for years is just kind of doing it over and over again and trying new things Well, let's get back to Jehu. Okay. 
How did that band come together? Um, I was in a band before Jehu called Night Soil Man, um, along with the bass player of Jehu, Jehu uh, Mike. Um, he and I were the rhythm section. And we were a pretty you know, popular band in San Diego. Um, and then John and Rick were in a band called Pitchfork, also a very popular band in San Diego. Both bands broke up around the same time, and Mike and John started playing together um, for some post Jehu, or sorry, post Pitchfork sort of project. And when I found out, I was like super excited, and like I talked Mike into letting me come in and try out. Basically, they were they were already playing with another drummer, but um, he was in LA, and I was local, so um, I got the got the gig. And then Rick was already playing with him too, so it was it became kind of like a San Diego super group and um, yeah. Did it feel like it clicked in right away? Yeah, I think because there was so much mutual respect um, from all the people involved. I think, you know, I think John and Rick would say that Night's Little Man was one of their favorite bands and Mike and I would say that Pitchfork was one of our favorite bands. So like we just went into it like just in love with each other and um, just excited about making music together. What were your hopes for the band? I mean, you've heard Jehu. It's like, we, we, I never thought it would get as far as it did. Um, it was almost surprising to me at the time when you guys signed to a major label. Yeah, yeah. It was um, surprising to, I think, all, all of us. Um, and, but cool. It worked out pretty well. It gave, gave that was, gave me a career, basically. You mean as a drummer? Getting, signing to a major label, getting a little bit of a bonus, um, getting, being able to, um, uh, quit my job and make records, being able to make the Drive Like Jehu record, um, all those things kind of contributed to me having a career, you know, being someone that people wanted to work with, even though I didn't know what the fuck I was doing, you know. <laughs> I mean, the, the Jehu record, like, was one of my first projects I ever did, and it sounds like it. Okay, so from the outside, it seems like one thing led to another, and you just kind of incrementally built this really great career for yourself. Uh, what were you struggling with at the time? What were the challenges as things were moving along? If, at, for like production stuff? Yeah, or? for production stuff. And I think as the, an fact, artist. the fact that like I was self taught has always haunted me. Did you feel like an imposter? Yeah, totally had that imposter syndrome. Um, always felt like I didn't know what I was doing always felt like you know someone was gonna find out and you know I'd never work again kind of thing you know I just always felt unsure and unconfident I mean I'm naturally sort of lack a certain confidence about stuff I do um but with the recording because I was like you know I literally didn't know what I was doing and and you know I figured that even even if I had like maybe studied under somebody or done like uh you know worked as a runner in a studio and saw how other people worked even that just little little bits of knowledge would have made me feel a lot better about what I was doing but I I didn't I, I never worked with anybody and I never like I rarely rarely hired anybody so it was like I was doing everything myself and working in a bubble in San Diego I didn't have a network of producers that I hung out with or whatever um there was no gear sluts back then well, there I think well, yeah, I don't think it existed. So like I didn't, yeah, I didn't really know what, if, if what I was doing was good. But isn't that how you develop a style? Yeah, it is for sure. And I definitely developed a style, I think. What was your role in Jehu? Um, I was, my role was pain in the ass, probably. Like, I kind of made things hard. Because at the time, like, when Jehu was, like, going, I was, like, getting into, like, you know, things like Slint and Bastro and, like, like little, or, like, Sonic Youth and whatever. And, like, I just wanted everything to be long and noisy and drawn out and dramatic and... Did so that. why did that make everything hard? Because you wanted things to be more complicated and kind of... I did, yeah. Yeah. And so, like, everything was like... And I, I'm just... A, like, everything... With everything, it's like everything's never... Nothing's ever good enough kind of thing. So I just always want things more, more, more. It's like... Do you ever aspire to 
embrace whatever you have and like be grateful for what the way things turn out sure. like it is like okay this is a problem that i never think anything is good enough or, uh-huh. or are you just like that ah, that's who i am that's just how it's going to be i this is me projecting my issues yeah too so yeah your issues are what yeah i i feel that way too i'm always looking for something more and doing something else mm-hmm. i mean that's great i i feel like it's an i feel like it's an asset up to a point um it's also somewhat of an aversion tactic or like a no it's like an avoidance tactic like uh not living in the present if you're always kind of thinking about what's the next step yeah for me like that's the danger of it yeah oh it, it, or is it i mean i i am that's separate for me i like if we're talking about like working on a song say and yeah. wanting it to be better and and isn't that in the moment or no I don't, know. Moment. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just like, it's like micro focusing on like the tiniest things that don't matter. Um, but it feels very in the moment. Maybe, yeah. maybe too much. So not stepping back and thinking about the future and, or like how it, all I know is if you get two micro, sometimes it sucks the life out of something. Sure. Yeah. And also maybe sometimes it's better to have like three really great songs than to like spend all this time trying to make a perfect song too. I fully. Believe I don't know. That. I, I, mean, I, I. I. These are ideas I toss around with and struggle with. <laughs> yeah. No. I fully believe that it's better to just produce than it is to like just keep overthinking something. So, are you somebody that benefits from deadlines? Yeah, I think so. I think I would. Without deadlines, I would work on something forever. Um, it's that way with records. Like I could. I. I would be mixing and mixing forever unless I had to have it finished by a certain time. Cause I'll, there's always something to do. There's always something to fix. Um, so yeah. Well, how central to your identity was being a drummer and then a producer? Like, did you take a lot of pride in that stuff or was, was it a job? No, I absolutely, I loved, I didn't like being in a band. I, why no, not? I didn't like, wait, I let me rephrase that. I didn't like the work a, like that it took to be in a band. I didn't, you I mean don't like the interpersonal work. No, I didn't like playing, like practicing. Yeah. I didn't rehearsing touring. I didn't like, I didn't like any of that stuff recording. I, I loved, but why like, didn't you like touring just driving around all the time? And yeah, being at some on a, someone else's schedule, being like not being able to do whatever I wanted to do, you know, a, yeah. it was just a grind and we didn't even tour that much and I didn't like it. Um, being away from home. I'm a homebody. I'm a loner. I, you know, like being stuck with four guys, three other guys, or whatever, for weeks on end is just, you know, and I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm just not wired that way. Um, Did you I ever loved, want to be a giant rock star as an adult? Was that uh-uh. an aspiration? No, no, no. I liked, I, I, I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to have a career as a record producer. Okay. So you already knew that's what you wanted to do, even when you were playing drums in Jehu. Yeah. I think at that point I did. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that was like, I was I liked making records. I liked I liked the recording process. That was the the part of being in a band that I really enjoyed. As a producer, what is your role? My role, I always try to take the role of like trying to be to look at the big picture and not. And this is again going against the things I was saying before, but like try not to get too sucked into the minutia of record making. Well, I think it makes sense with what you were saying before, because that's why if you are making a record that you're on, you would want to hire someone else to look at the big picture for yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I feel like it's it's really easy to get sucked into all that like nitty gritty stuff. And you need someone to sort of help like kind of, you know, guide and be like, uh, you know, this isn't let's keep working on this other thing like this is or let's come back to this later maybe or something just trying to keep the the boat moving do you think that you're able to instill confidence in people am i yeah i don't think so i think i'm terrible i mean one of my weaknesses as a record producer was that um i'm a i'm not a great people person and i'm not a cheerleader and so like if if you're insecure and you're you're singing or whatever i'm probably the bad (laughs) wrong person to have on the other side of the glass because I'm just like, that's good. That's bad. It's just kind of cut and dry. Like, let's do it again. You know, I'm not like 
hyping you up and making you feel good and like lighting candles and incense and like putting up tapestries and whatever and just being all about the vibe and all that it's like no let's just get this shit done kind of thing and and i some people like that and some people don't you know uh i've always felt like it was probably one of my weaknesses as far as like uh you know this is the peep the interpersonal part of the job This episode of The Trap Set is brought to you in part by Colectivo Coffee, handmade coffee since 1993. Check them out online at colectivo.com. When did you decide that you didn't want to produce records or that you wanted to take a break? I never really, I I never really did. I just sort of, uh, I just sort of like... You made a choice to open a restaurant. Yeah. Which would... I'm sure you had probably heard it would eat up all your time. Yeah, sure. But I mean, I I was making records, making less records. Budgets were shrinking. Um, I never had a studio, so I was kind of dependent on other people's studios and renting out places. Um, I could mix at home, but like I couldn't actually record anything uh, occasionally. Tell me about why you decided to open up Donut Friend, your donut shop. Um, like. The re well the the reason why I decided to open up Donut Friend was because of what I just said like the you know I had to do something but yeah Donut but Friend the, the logical conclusion isn't necessarily oh well the music industry is not what it used to be so I'll open up a donut shop like what about donuts in particular appealed to you uh it wasn't donuts in particular it was just that I had the idea it was it was the idea for Donut Friend not it could have been anything so for folks that haven't been to Donut Friend how does it differ from other donut shops. Um, the, the concept of donut friend is it was always like a DIY donut shop. It was like, we will build, make your donut to order. Kind of, we don't actually fry to order, but like, we will like assemble the donut. Basically a donut shop meets a yoga shop. That was the concept. Were you able to apply your kind of perfectionist tendencies to say the dough recipe? Apply or was I victim of, you know, like (laughs) I, I definitely... Uh, all that nit, you know, nitpicking and like, like I made it's totally so essential. many versions of the donuts like over and over and over again. Yeah. Like, um, How many? I, oh, hundreds, I mean, hundreds, probably. Like I, I'm still tweaking it to this day. Like still tweaking that recipe. Um, when we, I thought I had everything together. I did the like all my recipes. I thought I was like pretty good. Things seemed good. Built the restaurant. Um, had all like real equipment and started making donuts and was like, this isn't that good. And so basically decided I'm not going to open for another couple months until I actually really get this right. And so it was just, again, this like just this iterative process where I just kept making donut after donut, after donut, after donut. And finally at some point had to be like, just like throw my hands up and go like, it's not going to be perfect, but we got to open You know, so I had to like have a self-imposed deadline of like, just fucking stop it and just (laughs) let's start selling donuts and I'll just figure it out. You know, so when we opened, I actually wasn't that all that stoked on the donuts. (laughs) Just terrible. (laughs) Sounds about right. Yeah. (laughs) So then uh, did you hire a publicist? Mm -mm. But you got a fair amount of press for the shop. Yeah. Uh, And you had to be the face of the shop and you weren't even psyched about the product yet. So yeah, it's how did hard. You do it? it was hard to be like psyched when I wasn't that, you know, I didn't feel very confident, but see, I mean, I'm used to that. That's, that's sort of where I live. I I'm in this constant state of not sure of uncertainty of, of what right. I'm doing, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, what I keep hearing is like this idea that you are kind of navigating between two tendencies. One is this imposter syndrome, right? Yeah. And then the other one is you have the ability to just try something. Like, yeah. even though maybe you didn't feel like you were qualified to produce records, you didn't make the choice to go get an internship at a big studio in LA or 
you know, work under somebody or apprentice. You just did it. Yeah. And the same thing with the donut shop. It's not yeah. like you went and said, okay, I'll become a, an employee at some other donut shop yeah, and see how they do it and take the best or ideas something. or whatever. Yeah. You, know? you just did it. So there is that part of you. And where does that part of you come from? I don't know. It, the part, the part of me is there's, there's an ego there, I think, or pride or something that I like, I can do this. I know I can do this. If I just put enough into it, I can do this. Um, were you ever like panicking? Like, Oh fuck. I just invested a bunch of money into a donut business and I have no fucking clue what I'm doing. Or did you feel confident? No, me confident. No, <laughs> no confidence. But like I, well, you have I this was kind like, of dual personality of confidence and also like I have this to make it work ineptitude too. I'm, yeah. I'm going to make it work. I, I, I was, I was confident that I didn't, I, I was confident that I would figure it out. Well, I guess, I mean, there's, it seems there's, like you get some sort of a thrill like you mentioned, you sold your house to start this business. Yeah. I, so I there's something in. about there's something about your personality where you embrace like pushing yourself off the cliff and then having to learn how to fly somehow. Yeah, I I, I would agree with that. Um, I I I mean, yeah, I mean that's been amazing to to like to look back and see that like what I what I was able to do, not knowing. And like any of this stuff, not having, I never had employees. I mean, I'd hired people once in a while, maybe to help tune drums or something like that, but like, or edit drums maybe, or, um, but I, yeah, work dealing with employees or, or any of the like bullshit paperwork stuff or yeah, like the, the design, the aesthetic of it, you know, like the whole, all of that, I'm just so stoked on. Well, let's like, move that into the donut world do you ever worry that you've like over tweaked recipes and like oh shit maybe it was better a month ago and how do you save all the different like do you write meticulously write down anything that you change so that you can go back yeah i've got a database of all the recipes with every single tweak that i've done <laughs> that's um, so awesome <laughs> uh and yeah, I mean, there's times when, I, like, I just recently, just yesterday, actually, we tweaked, we went back. Like, I had made a change, and I felt like it was maybe not the best, so we just reverted back to the original. Do you cook at home? Not so much anymore. Um, I want to open up more, more donut friends. I want to, I want to have, get like four or five of these things in LA. Um, cause that's to me was the, that's always been the goal. It's not just one donut shop. I kind of want to have an, a bunch. I mean like five, that would be great. Um, just because I feel like, uh, donut friend is doing what it's doing in its current state, I want to see what it would be, what, how it would do somewhere else in a different part of town. You know, how would it do downtown? How would it do in the Valley? How, you know, like, I don't know. I just want to kind of see how it would thrive in different parts of town. Would you be interested in getting investors to scale it up? I've or talked would to, you, are you worried that that would be the same thing as like when you were working with major labels and they were interfering too much? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been talking to people about, investing like and that's definitely my concern like i like the idea <laughs> of just doing it myself like when i when i first started talking to him it was like a year ago or something and i needed investors um i didn't have the money saved up but now it's like a year later i i could probably do another location myself just with the funds that donut friend has do you have any uh other personal goals like do you want to have children someday or get married or uh is are you just focused on donut friend right now it's it's all donut friend right now i mean i've wanted to have a family um i think that i'm probably donut friend may not have happened if i had a family um because i wouldn't be taking the risks that i took with it you know if i had a family to feed or whatever um but I do feel like that's a huge, honestly, I feel like if you don't have a family and this is going to bum people out probably, um, 
then what's the point of being on this planet anyway? If you don't have kids, <laughs> then this is the only, ultimately the only thing we're supposed to do is just have kids. And Says I, who? Says uh, biology. Okay. Says evolution. Like, if, I mean, not that, not that, yeah, if, I don't know. I just feel like that that is what we're on the the earth for is to extend the human species into the future. And um, so ha- not having kids is something that I feel like is... Um, Does it make you feel like less of a man? No, it doesn't make me feel like less of a man. It makes me feel like less of a human. Um, uh, but... I have a friend whose father told him, like, you're not going to be a real man. You won't understand what it is to be a real man until you're responsible for your children. Right. And my dad never would have said something like that to me. Uh, Mine never said And sometimes I'm like, huh, I wonder if somebody said that to me at a time when I was coming of age, how my life would be different. Yeah. But if somebody, actually, if someone would have said that to me when I was in high school, I probably would have thought it was a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. (laughs) Just ignored it. It, I, because you know, I don't look, disagree look, with that. Look at everything that you've done. Uh, you, you've made records that people love. Your donut shop is providing sustenance to people. People love the experience of going there. So there, I mean, it's not like it's you're leading a meaningless existence. People are, you're contributing to the world in some way, right? Am I though? Like really? Come on. I, well, it's a do you have a girl? Do you have a girlfriend? I do. Yeah. Does she want to have kids? Yeah. Then yeah. you'll probably have kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How much say do I have in this? Um, yeah. I mean, it's you know, like it's I, I, it's, it's a donut shop. It's a like, you know, and the records I made were, you know, they weren't. They millions they, of people listened to them. A couple, or whatever, and it, you know. I don't know. It's it's hard. I I mean that's I the like thing that I think lots of artists are juggling. It's like is my creative output procreation a, enough mm-hmm. or do I have to have biological offspring? Yeah, the, I the mean the planet is overcrowded, blah blah blah. You know, yeah. Is it responsible? It goes back to what you were talking about in the beginning about spirituality and like, you know, do you, did I ever que- those are the questions that I ask, not where do we go when we die? I don't care. But what are we doing when we're here? That's that's the questions that I I ask. You know, like what's the point of any of this? Um, when I when I'm gone, like I don't I, whatever, I don't give a shit about that. Right. How do you think about yourself? Like, how do you? Where does your sense of self come from now? Not, I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you the guy that? runs donut friend or are you mark like oh you know what i mean like well i think that i am the guy that runs donut friend like just similar to how jehu was like i was the drummer of drive like jehu Um, but it must be somewhat empowering to know that you shed one identity and took on another and then took on another and it worked out so so you're not bound to any one thing yeah which is true that's very true I, i actually had never really thought of it that way but yeah that's that's true um. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so next, maybe you'll go back to computers or make an app or something like that. That would be rad. I believe that it will work out for you some way. <laughs> Mark Trombino, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thank you. The Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. Trap Set.